Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! You have heard me, not as much as I used to do, but you have in the past heard me discuss my box of trolls with a curious mixture of, of confusion and, uh, and affection over, over the years. People who dedicate inordinate amounts of time to uh, bombarding people like me with um, usually sort of fairly testy far-right or, or, or immigration-obsessed or just James O'Brien-obsessed abuse. There's one bloke who used to um, spend every single day making his own big bingo card and ticking off words and phrases that I use, which I I'm sort of, is it wrong to be almost flattered by that? But I think he's a real person. Well, I detected about a year ago, actually before that, in the run-up to the referendum, and then it doubled down during Trump, um, was a, a change in the nature of some of the abuse we were getting, particularly here. And I, it, it oddly always seemed to be, someone made a joke about it about six months ago, so it's, it's your dad's, if you want, they said, if you want to be your Russian bot name, um, it's your dad's Christian name followed by eight random numbers. And I, and I started looking uh, at, at the sort of, uh, if you take your quality filter off on Twitter, then you see a, a lot of the stuff that ordinarily you don't notice. And there were, there were hundreds of them. It was like it was like being Michael Caine in Zulu. <laughs> There's thousands of them, and and I, I know, it takes such a degree of arrogance or conceit to think that you're being targeted by some sort of official conspiracy, formal conspiracy, that that I never did. But the weird crossover between Brexit and Trump trolls was impossible to ignore. It kicked off again slightly during the French election with the same kind of accounts coming down in, in Marine Le Pen's favour, but obviously they were English language accounts, so it didn't quite have the impact upon the result in France that many people argue it had upon the result in the referendum and in America. And, and about a week ago, someone picked up on a fella called David Jones, who again has uh, several random numbers appearing after his name, and pointed out that he appeared to be following a sort of Kremlin-led agenda on everything from from the Ukraine, the passenger jets shot down over eastern Ukraine in 2014, right through to Brexit and pro-Trump stuff. So I did a little search on his name and my name, and he's all over me. Absolutely all over me. And all the usual suspects from those sort of camps who appear to be real people are desperately retweeting him and replying to him. And, and, and then today I read that he is um, quite possibly a pro-Kremlin propaganda troll posing as a UKIP supporter. So I need to find out more about this and how widespread it is. Mike Hind is an investigative freelance journalist who will not have been as surprised by recent developments as I have been, not least because I've read an article he wrote for the New European on this issue not long ago. So, Mike, where do we even start? Morning, James. Uh, you, indeed, that's a very good question um, because uh, I think what we have here is a situation that's a little bit like those Russian dolls. There is a fake persona mm. buried inside a fake persona and so on. It seems to be almost infinite. But uh, David Joe 52951945 came onto my radar about a year ago because I was particularly interested to notice that all of these pro-Brexit and uh, latterly pro-Trump um, beacons of free speech were incredibly shy. Yes. Most of them seem to be anonymous and they are also obsessed with people like you. Um, so, <laughs> there's nothing wrong having, with that. <laughs> having, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But um, they're even obsessed with me. Because, um, because you started I, sniffing I, I, around. That's right, and they really object to that. So, on the uh, on the subject of David Joe five two nine five one nine four five, this account had about sixty thousand followers back in November last year when I started to take an interest, and I was noticing that it was very much a hub for the sharing of uh, really unpleasant content, not just politically unpalatable to the likes of me and sure. the card remainder but really nasty stuff um, sort of immigration focused so I began to have a look around and see if I could find out who David Joe uh, uh, was 
And I did some digging and uh, not just Googling, but using sort of open source, in, uh, open source intelligence tools. And eventually I found a, a phone number that appeared to be linked with that account. Mm. And when I looked that up, it turned out to be uh, the UKIP office in Upper Ban in Northern Ireland, okay. where the councillor is a guy called David Jones. Uh, and so I so I interviewed him. Now I'm not saying that David Jones, Councillor David Jones, is David Joe five two nine five one nine four five, but the coincidence is kind of curious. And not not and least because the the Twitter account claims to be coming from the Solent. Yeah, exactly. But they never come from where they say. Um, you will never find really any identifiable information uh, on any of these accounts. They will almost always either have a made-up location or a false location. But I had a chat with David Jones, hmm. um, Councillor David Jones, and that was an interesting chat. Now, Did he know why his number was attached to this Twitter well, account? I, I asked him, and I made a contemporaneous note uh, in shorthand, uh, and uh, there was just something I felt was slightly sketchy during mm. the conversation, because his first words to me were, that's not me, that's not me. Okay. And then he said, I think that's somebody from down in the Isle of Wight or the south of England. So he was very well aware uh, of, of the account. Now, having... Having said that, not me, that's not me, uh, he then went on to say, and I explained to him, that his phone number appeared to be linked somewhere in the deep web mm. uh, with that account. Uh, he, he then said he had been asked about it before, and it isn't him. But then he said, a couple of minutes later, no, nobody has ever asked me before. So we published this in the New European mm. last December because it seemed important that such an influential account, and I believe it now has over 120,000 followers, such an influential account being completely anonymous just didn't seem, just didn't quite seem legit to me. Fair enough. Um, um, well, just, just, we, just... Are we pub Go on, I, I, do, I want to move you along, if I can, to, 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 to the Kremlin, the so-called Kremlin connection. Where does that come into play? Well, I am, I am slightly wary of the Kremlin connection. Now, I'm aware that there's a data scientist in the US who has analysed David Joe 52951945's yes. activity, and it does indeed... Uh, follow certain patterns for uh, for Kremlin trolls and tr Kremlin bots, and I've no reason to uh, to suggest that that account isn't being run out of Russia. But I think that what what's concerning about this really is if we blame the Russians and we start looking for Russians under the bed all the time, we kind of forget the fact that there are hyper partisan, highly motivated. British and American motivators in this world of disinformation, mm. computational propaganda as it's as it's known. And let's not forget that David Joe five two nine five one nine four five on its biography, until it remodelled its biography this morning, I noticed. After the time private, story, yes. Yeah. Um, it had a leave dot EU banner. Now that for me says that's a leave dot EU account. And we know that we know that Leave.eu spent the bulk of their budget during the referendum last year on online activity. So my assumption was that it was just a Leave EU account. But it remains a mystery. And now we've had my story with the councillor David Jones, yes. whose phone number appeared to be linked with it, denying it. And now he's, uh, and now the operator of the account is also denying it to the time. Had anything to do with uh, so I'm happy to reiterate those denials, obviously. I mean, the legal situation being clear, no laws have been broken, no um, no offences have been committed, but many mysteries remain. When, when I read about sort of uh, troll factories in St. Petersburg known to work 12-hour shifts, am I, am I falling foul of that? trying to find Russians under the bed all the time, or is there a degree of reality in these reports? No, I, I don't think you are. Um, I, I, there certainly are Russian accounts. I, I have a group of uh, 
kind of co-investigators online. Gosh. And we constantly, constantly find that the accounts that we're tangling with and, and digging up are actually operating. There, How can you tell? Because I, I, you, you mentioned that people like me tend to be the focus of, of a lot of obsession of these people. How can I tell? I mean, I appreciate the number followed by lots of, the name followed by lots of numbers, but they're not, I mean, that's a real person doing that because it's too, it couldn't be generated by a computer. It's too subtle. In, uh, some of them you think are generated by computer. How can you tell who's fake and who's real, Mike? It's impossible to oh, tell. No. <laughs> I did a, another feature for the, uh, for, the, for the latest New European yes. in which I interviewed Lisa Maria Noydert at uh, the Oxford Internet Institute, and those guys spend all day, every day, investigating bots. And, uh, uh, and Lisa Maria was telling me that uh, they are now so sophisticated it can be impossible to know whether or not you are uh, interacting with a chat bot. Or with, a, or with a real person. But some of the stuff is going to be... I, I had a fellow who made a massive bingo card about words that I use on the programme, and he used to tick them off when I, whenever I said them in order to prove how awful I am and how much he doesn't listen. That's real. That can't be generated by a bot, can it? Mostly, uh, it, first of all, there are two types of bots. There are bots which are purely automated algorithms which are sharing pre-programmed content. And those are the people and that follow you and they always... Because I, I picked this up on holiday when I turned off my quality filter. A lot of people following me yeah. with no followers of their own and almost identical yeah. lists of the people they were following. So it would be Faisal Islam at Sky. It would be yeah. um, Mehdi Hassan quite often. And then you'd have Owen Jones there. And then you'd also have like the UK government and you might have the Daily Telegraph, and that, but it was almost word for word. I'd see five or six in a row, all with different yeah. names, but all fo and all with no followers, but all following exactly the same 79 or 80 people. Yeah, that's right. And many of these are coming from Russia, but I believe, and I've seen evidence to suggest this, many of them are also coming out of the United States right. as well. And you will read, if you, if you look into this, you will read about Trump's digital uh, operation um, and uh, the money behind that from uh, from the Mercers, a lot of that has been sunk into uh, into fake online personas. Carol Cadwallader in the Observer has written a lot about this, hasn't she? About the the, the yeah. data mining. Yes, that's right. And uh, I interviewed Carol for the for the latest piece in the New European, and, and I recommend that. Mm. I think one of the important things to understand about this is the term for it, which is astroturfing. The purpose of these accounts, because lots of people get frustrated and say, well, no one's being converted. I'm not being converted. I'm not being convinced to change my point exactly. of view. I'm not going to become a racist idiot. But the purpose of astroturfing and the reason people like you and Faisal Islam uh, are targeted so much is that you are influencers. And what they want to achieve is to create the impression of a false social consensus. That's why they flood the online world with this information, because anybody happening along to see that, and that includes politicians and policymakers and yeah. other journalists, they want them to believe that this is the social consensus. That's what they're manufacturing. It's entirely manufacturing a false social consensus. Now, as oh. a citizen, I am concerned I'm scared, that so much of that is coming from Russia. <laughs> yes. But I'm also concerned that a lot of it isn't coming from Russia. I believe a lot of it is coming from at home. I believe quite a lot of it is coming from the likes of... David Joe five two nine yes. five one nine four five, and we want to know where it's coming from. And the most important defence against this is something that they call at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Laboratory, uh, digital media literacy. We're all getting very excited about the you know the bad the Russians under the bed, and and they are under the bed. Yes, but. The best defense against this is digital media literacy. What's important is that we recognize it when we see it so that we can either ignore it or block it or ideally both. So here's, here's, the, here's the thing, thing. I, and, and I know we've been talking about Twitter. Does it happen on Facebook as well? It does, yeah. Here's, can I, I just read you something that someone called Joshua sent to me yesterday? Is there a sinister cabal yeah. to discredit at Mr. James O'B that I've never heard of? Some of the views on the LBC comments page are ludicrous. 
Yeah. So that, that would be astroturfing. And some, look, there's plenty of people out there who think I'm the absolute antichrist, and that's perfectly reasonable, and I respect their opinion completely. But, but he's right. I mean, some of it is, is beyond comical, and I've always giggled. But you're saying they're trying to create a false social consensus which says anybody who says that we shouldn't be deporting everybody brown is somehow at odds with the, with the view of the nation. Exactly. And oh, one boy. of the other purposes of it is to make it more difficult to openly support your point of view. Or... Or because they'll pile in and, and abuse and insult people who, who dare to say that yeah. being, a, being a racist idiot is probably a bad thing. Exactly, because what they really want you to do is to shut up, and they want your, your supporters to shut up as well. well I it never. happens all the time on Facebook. Should LBC um, be doing more, then, on our Facebook page? Should we actually be trying to establish whether or not, or on our Twitter feed, whether these people are real or whether or not they're, they're, they're simply trying to completely subvert debate? I mean, to be fair, we've got people on the payroll who are the heroes of these, these kind of uh, propagandists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you disappear, if you do do that you run into the problem of uh, things being almost impossible to prove, yeah. and you fall down an endless rabbit hole. Remember the analogy I used at the top of this chat yeah. about the Russian dolls inside the Russian dolls? Yes. Uh, yeah, another analogy is a rabbit hole. I'm investigating at the moment a particular Twitter account which uh, which is very interested in Faisal Islam. Yes. And that has led me to... Uh, a whole load of dormant bots on Facebook. These are accounts on Facebook, hundreds of them, which are just sitting there doing nothing. And when you reverse image search their their pictures, they all happen to be porn stars. Yes. And this account is also linked with fake LinkedIn pages, fake LinkedIn profiles, fake Blimey. company websites... So a contact of mine, a, a guy called John Gray, who's the co-founder of uh, a social media analytics tool called Mention Map, yes. he blogs on this uh, regularly. He calls it the ecosystem of fake. And I think the, I think the bigger story, we can remain interested in the Russian influence, but yes. let's just take that as given. The bigger story is the ecosystem of fake and the fact that online you cannot ever be sure that what you're seeing is coming from the person they claim to be and you cannot trust it unless you know it's bona fide. Oh, you, you, That's you, why journal, real journalism is more important than it's ever been before. Because there's so much genuine fake news out there, which, of course, uh, some uh, politicians are very keen to uh, portray as being done by the people doing the real news. Mike, can we talk again? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel we've barely scratched the surface, although you've been on for 20 minutes, but I'd, I'd love to pick your brains a little more in the future, and I shall tweet from my uh, Twitter account uh, the articles in the New European to which you refer. Thank you ever so much. This is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, this story, right? I think it will, and what I'm delighted about today is that the Times has at last waded in. The problem Following the Observer. Been, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and, 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 and people like me who are on the receiving end of it are, are actually almost sort of encouraged by the knowledge that we're not going nuts. There really are so, so, sort of an unconscionable number of weird accounts out there targeting, targeting people like us. Mike, we'll talk again, and yeah, thank you. I'm absolutely as fascinated as you are by the conversation that we just had with Mike Hind. If you want to find links to his articles or indeed to him, just go to my Twitter account, at Mr. James O.B. And uh, <laughs> just unbelievable. And yet... I don't know about you, I don't know how much time you spend on social media, suddenly a lot of stuff begins to make sense. An awful lot of stuff begins to make sense. I've got nearly 3,000 people blocked on Twitter, and when I look through that list, um, you, you, you see this weird kind of constant echoing of the same memes and the same themes, trying to create this idea that everybody thinks all oh, Muslims are terrorists, all oh, Muslims are paedophiles, all immigrants are awful, constantly, constantly doing it, and spending more time attacking people like me than they do anything else at all and that's why because of course you know the, the greatest enemy of all time of propaganda and lies is people who tell the truth so of course you're going to spend all your time attacking people who tell the truth well, one of the other controversial features of the presidential campaign was the influence of fake news stories headlines like the pope endorses donald trump for president and the nypd announces they are arresting hillary clinton on pedophilia and treason charges 
repeatedly cropping up on Facebook and other social media sites. Tonight, Channel 4 News can reveal that a cottage industry producing such stories has sprung up in an unexpected location. But who is behind them? What are their motives? Kieran Jenkins has this exclusive report. In a US election like no other, made-up news took center stage. Donald Trump triumphed with some extraordinary claims. Our enemies may have a blackmail file on Crooked Hillary. Completely false stories went mainstream. Americans didn't know who to believe. There's so much active misinformation, and it's packaged very well, and it looks the same when you see it on a Facebook page or you turn on your television. Democracy itself in the most powerful nation on earth may have been undermined by fake news. President-elect of the United States of America, Donald Trump. You should probably know where much of it comes from. The answer is Veles, a small town in central Macedonia. How popular is it? Oh, well, pretty much. About 200 people, maybe. 200 people? Yeah. And making fake news websites? Yes. They used to rely on heavy industry in Veles. Now, they manufacture misinformation. First lady is actually the first man. What? <laughs> That's so stupid, though. To this unlikely place, we've traced over 100 websites bombarding US voters with fake news. For Macedonian millennials, it's a digital gold rush. How much money do they make? Yeah, there are some people who make like 200K or something like that. 200,000 euros? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're kidding? Yeah, no, I'm not joking. It's true. The sites have names like USA Newsflash or USA Online Politics. Some falsely report that Hillary Clinton is a paedophile, that she sold arms to ISIS. Americans who've fallen for these stories may find what follows pretty sobering. This is Philip Malazanov, 17 years old. So you run a fake news website? No. Yes, you do. And this is his slick-looking news service. He told his 10,000 mainly American followers that Hillary Clinton was facing FBI charges. We have your website address. No, no. It's registered in your name. Can you just tell me why you do it? Why I... don't you want to? Why don't you want to talk about it? Why not? I don't talk about it. What, what have you got to hide? Now the rest of the world may be scratching their heads, but here they tell you there's really quite a simple explanation. They already knew how to make money from websites here. They already knew how to attract American Facebook audiences. The difference, the game changer, they tell you, was Donald J. Trump. The Donald is something of a hero in Veles. Donald Trump, do you like him? Donald Trump is a boy, yeah? Da. Hillary? Hillary Clinton? Sure. Hillary? Like Hillary Clinton? Nah. His army of supporters can't seem to get enough of the local speciality. On Facebook, Velez-based portals are listed as news companies. This one has over 600,000 followers. As users click onto their site and into an advert, the money rolls in. So who are these fake news masterminds exactly? In a quiet residential street, enter Victor. Are you Victor? No. No? What's your name? Steven. Steven. Real news has uh, caught up with him. So let's go again. What's your name? Victor. Victor. Oh, it is Victor. We, we've been very lucky to meet the editor of 24 Total News today. He is glad also. <laughs> Victor is 16. This is his news website. He says that people like his stories about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is good for you. Yes. You can make Donald some Trump money. Yes. Yes. They are thirsty for the articles. That's all I have to say about them. They want to hear news about Donald Trump. Just tell me, why are you doing this? What's in it for you? For money, for recreation, 
I don't know how to put this. There isn't much to do around here. A lot of kids don't go out. We're doing this out of boredom. This story is wrong. It's on your website. You are sharing it so that Americans can see this and they might believe it. Do you feel responsible for that? Do you feel bad? No. No. Do you feel bad? Yes. So what, what happens next? He will delete the post. Will you carry on with the website? Facebook's founder said they take misinformation seriously. He promised stronger detection of fake news and to make reporting it easier, as well as making it harder for fake news sites to make money. Do you think it's true or false? True. True? True. False? No. No false. False? No, no, no. The Pope doesn't support Donald Trump. And in Veles, business is still booming, not least for the savvy young minds at the town's computer science faculty, where the truth takes some teasing out. Would you be tempted to do this? No. No? No. Why not? I don't understand. I don't know how to work with sites. No? No. What do you study? I study... <laughs> I don't know. You don't know what you study? No. Do you know anyone who makes a website like this? No. A little smile. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, really. Now those young men you've just seen have now gone into their computer science lecture. Off camera, each one of them admitted that yes, they do run a fake news website. Claims of Russian involvement here seem far-fetched. If they aren't at it, though, they might be soon. Fakery dreamt up in Macedonia has shown US democracy to be vulnerable. Nothing is as it seems anymore, and in this town, they call that a job well done. Kieran Jenkins in Macedonia. So did fake news made in Macedonia make a difference in the US election? Well, Jackie Long has been out in Washington, D.C., testing voters with some of the fake news stories that were circulating during the campaign and asking what impact they had. Four journalists with the inside track on the campaign trail. We've got breaking news coming out of California. This is news, old school. Donald Trump blasted them and newspapers as liars misinforming the public. So many people now turning to social media instead in their search for news. I wasn't born in the United States of America. Uh, I come from Kenya. Yeah. A pretty crude online version of Trump's birther theory that ran for many months in the campaign, liked by many of his supporters, including Stephen Wagner from Delaware. I believe that that video was mocked up and was, was dubbed and everything else and was created to say something that we'd all like to hear him admit. Okay, so the, so the video, I believe, was fabricated. But if Barack Obama were to ever tell the truth, that would be the video. Mr. Wagner liked or shared some of the stories our program discovered had been made in Macedonia, including the one claiming Michelle Obama is a man. You're saying that you don't mind that these fake stories are being created our own news media is creating fake stories. So I don't have to worry about Macedonia. We have CNN. There's real life fallout from some fake news. This Washington pizza restaurant was wrongly targeted online as the center of a paedophile ring supposedly involving Hillary Clinton. Locals here consider themselves politically astute, but were they ever caught out? As somebody who's, you know, younger and on social media and who has been on social media for a really, really long time, um, you kind of start to recognize what to filter out, um, what is true and what is not true based off of who is posting it. I'm just going to test you on this one. Okay, great. <laughs> is this true or do you think it's false? Uh, I would say no, that's not true. You don't think he said it? Hmm. Do I think he said something very similar? Yes. Do I think that it was published in People magazine in 1998? You really can't tell anymore. Fake news was an occupational hazard for a leader black, 
who campaigned for Hillary Clinton for four years. Did you ever get tricked yourself? Oh, I fell for a couple of them. And a friend of mine came back and said, whoa, Alita, this is fake. You know, so I had to go back and redo all my postings and tell everybody, don't, you know, don't read it, it's fake news. Is it real or fake? Did he say it? He said it before, but not in that string. So I'm saying it's a bunch of stuff run together. But can you see how a lot of people, Democrats, pass that round? Oh, in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. So fake news may be real, but the real question is how potent a weapon it was in this most contested of elections. Jackie Long reporting from Washington. Well, joining us now in the studio is Ella Whelan, assistant editor at Spiked Online, who doesn't want to see news regulated by social media host sites, whilst Claire Wardle, an academic at Tower Centre for Data Journalism, dedicates her research to verifying sources and understanding the algorithms that make the spread of fake news possible. So, do you actually think that this stuff should be clamped down upon? I don't think it should be clamped down upon in, in, in the form of regulation. I think there are ways that Facebook and Google can algorithmically come up with credibility indexes. So with Google, we might have 37 pages. The things on page one have been ordered in a way that we are, they are more trustworthy because more people link to them. So in the same way as Facebook, Macedonian teenager websites algorithmically we should be able to say we're not going to turn them off but they shouldn't rank as highly there should be a way that it can be automatically done ellie what's your solution uh, i think that we shouldn't have any regulation or any kind of messing around with what gets put out to the public i think that my belief is that the public decide for themselves what they think is true and not and i don't think that everybody was swayed by kind of ridiculous websites made cooked up in macedonia to, to, to what extent do you think that the conventional media plays a role in bringing fake news about? I think it's massively failed in that it's completely been... It's disjoint from what the, you know, people on the street are thinking and talking about. You know, there is a sense of the media, especially in the US and the UK, is in a kind of Westminster and Washington bubble and hold much of the public in contempt. So I'm not surprised that people are finding news in other places. Do you, do you actually think that, that, in some way, the social network has outrun the conventional media and the conventional media is in trouble. So what's happened is we've kind of seen the end of gatekeeping. So previously I would buy a newspaper from a newsstand and I knew what I was buying. I would tune in at 7 p.m. and I knew what I was watching. Now, as I get more of my news from the social networks, I can't tell the difference between a post that's come from a news site that's a credible site and something that's been built on a, on a basic blogging site. So the problem is without gatekeeping, these fake websites are designed to look like credible sites. They have the same looking design, they have the same images, the same sensationalist headlines, and that's what's difficult for consumers. How do you tell the difference when not everybody has a gatekeeper like you, John? Oh, steady. <laughs> but, but, I mean, one of the things which, which I think I found very surprising about Macedonia, let alone the fact that it was Macedonia, <laughs> was the fact that somebody was paying to advertise on it. I mean, that, that was how their income was generated. That seems absurd. Uh, yeah, it does seem absurd. I mean, uh, there's a certain element of me that thinks fair play to these guys that have managed to do something like that. I think that the basis of good journalism should be the pursuit of truth. But we get into a very different territory when we ask for a gatekeeper um, or somebody to define what that truth is, and that worries me. And, and then what about Brexit? Do you think the same game was in, in play? I think the news ecosystem has changed fundamentally in the last couple of years, and I think there was a role simply in terms of people seeking information mm. and struggling to know who to trust. But Ella's right, that we're on a whole spectrum here of a very big grey middle, um, and what we just saw there was a very obvious, absolutely 100% false. The worrying part is this grey middle that everybody's now saying, how do we control this, and, and we shouldn't be thinking about doing that. But we're really in a, a sort of terrible place of multi-mirrored corridors. I mean, uh, in a post-truth world, how will we ever establish truth? I certainly don't think we live in a post-truth world. You I, don't? No, I don't. I don't think that people uh, who voted Trump, the millions of people that did, uh, did it on the basis of fake news stories, I don't think they did it on the basis of being misled. The same with Brexit. I think people voted uh, for the reasons that they did, and it wasn't p purely because the media had fed them a certain way. I think that's a very low view of, of people. Um, but and the thing about this is that we have press freedom and we, have, we should have freedom of speech simply because we allow the public to decide what they think is truth and what they think is lies. There's 
because, you know, knowledge is in the crowd. So perhaps freedom of speech is more precious than the truth? I think so. We are going to go through some very interesting times, and I think this, this element of how do we ensure that we're giving people the skills and the tools to know how to check what they're reading. And I think we just assume, particularly younger people, know how to do this automatically, and there's a lot that we can be teaching people. Thank you both very much for coming in.